Tour. And if you're here for the COVID-19 webinar on how to maximize your PPP loan forgiveness, you are in the right place. Uh, we had well over a thousand people register and uh, the number is ticking up very quickly. So I'm gonna give it maybe 60 more seconds and we'll go ahead and get started. I wanna let you know you're in the right place. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, we are going to talk about maximizing your PPP loan forgiveness in response to our COVID-19 webinar series. So last couple of weeks, we've done a handful of webinars where we talked about uh, the PPP loan, the EIDL loans, different funding options. Uh, and, we, and we took a, a high level look at what it took to get your loan forgiven under the PPP guidance. Uh, but as promised, uh, we're coming back this week to, to uh, do a much deeper dive. So uh, if you've been in a regular attender for these uh, sessions, thank you so much. Glad you're back. Uh, a couple of the early slides might look familiar. I promise we're going to get through them pretty quick. Um, and the majority of our content is are taking a much deeper dive. So before we jump in, uh, I want to cover you know what we're what we're talking about today and what we're not talking about today. So uh, th there's a whole bunch of uncertainty here uh, when it comes to the PPP loans. Uh, I'm gonna address that quite a bit here. Uh, what I am gonna talk about today is different options for sources of funding for COVID-19 relief, not just PPP, but really the, the meat here is uh, the rules, and I, and I hit hard the word rules, for getting your PPP loan forgiven. What, what, what this is not about, and I'm not trying to be cute here with, with the, the little graphic, uh, this is not about how to game the system. This is a taxpayer funded program designed to do exactly what the acronym says, Paycheck Protection Program. It's designed to get people paid and to help save and support small businesses as we get through this unprecedented event. So uh, the reality is there are a lot of squishy areas here. Uh, we have zero intention of, of uh, helping anybody figure out and manipulate for, the, for their benefit those squishy areas. Uh, but uh, what I would say is uh, on the surface, the ways to get a loan forgiven are pretty simple, but the devil's always in the details. And so when you get down into the meat, uh, it, uh, it, this actually gets real complex real fast. There's a whole bunch of unanswered questions. So uh, just to be clear, our, our goal today is to help you get as possible uh, so that you can uh, get as much forgiven in the loan as possible. The other thing I would say is a uh, bit of a safe harbor statement. You know, we're not your CPA, we're not your bank, uh, we're not your lawyer. Um, we do come to this topic though, and thinking we speak from a position of authority. Um, we are, as a company, we uh, have a board seat with the NPRC, that's the National Payroll Reporting Consortium. Uh, why is that important to you? So, uh, it, it, yeah, Ashore is, you know, surrounded by a bunch of household names uh, in the in the payroll business. And while we're talking about an SBA backed loan, the PPP program, um, it is up to companies to help their, their customers buy with these, I'm not talking about just uh, uh, family medical leave, emergency leave, et cetera. So those are, those are things that we participate with the NPRC and actually give helping and give guidance to Department of Labor, to the IRS, the SBA, uh, but specifically the topic of PPP, uh, in, in, you'll see on, on the end here, that really, really that small businesses have tools to be able to run loans properly and the, to the topic of today to be, get reimbursed properly. And so uh, we have built specific reports, not only to stay in compliance with the laws, but to be able to, uh, to maximize uh, and I'm getting I've got audio problems I, I 
all I can ask and, and do is beg for forgiveness, guys. Uh, I'll do my best to, to go through. That this session is being recorded, uh, and we will be sharing it out with everyone. So uh, 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 hopefully, everyone. All right. So let's start out first with small business stimulus courses. Uh, uh, I, I really mean this when I say Google is your best friend. So uh, the, the big money sits in PPP and EO. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But just go to Google, COVID grants four, uh, low interest loans four, and that four could be a geography, a city, a state, an industry, an association. Uh, there are more than I could possibly ever count number of funds that are created out there. So if you're an artist, there's a fund for you. If, if you're uh, uh, a public servant, there's a fund for you. If you're a manufacturer, for you, any geography, uh, United Way of Greater United Way of uh, Forsyth County, right? So there are endless resources. I couldn't possibly encourage you enough. There, there are there's money sitting there waiting for small businesses. They are they all have finite resources. The money will disappear. Go to Google, spend several hours. We have time. Look for those sources. Apply for grants. Apply for loans. You can always say no to the loans, but you can't get it get it if once the money make that your first place to go to okay that said let's talk about the, the the meat where the money really sits to help small businesses right now so a, a 350 billion uh, dollar stimulus so the the uh, cares act was a 2.2 trillion dollar dollar stimulus about 350 billion of that was going to the two programs the ppp paycheck protection program and the economic injury disaster loan the eid uh, most of you know that money ran out uh, a couple weeks ago, and tranche number two was approved a week ago, and the money started flowing again on Monday. We'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, how fast and shouldn't be thinking of, but without hesitation, start already apply now. Why I think this is still an important topic and why I'm going to spend a few minutes here is I think probably as most of you have um, I think a good share have been funded, but I think there's a significant percentage of the uh, of, of attendees they have applied. They maybe even have received an SBA approval number uh, that their bank provided to them <clears throat> to give, give them assurance that they have a, a spot in line, but you may not have been funded. Till you have been you still options that you need to need and, and we'll talk at the highest levels so difference between injury disaster loan the paycheck protection program it's a it's designed to do exactly what it says it is to protect paychecks there are only certain approved in which you can spend so the payroll which include benefits, and we'll talk what what the definition of salary is in, in, in another slide. Uh, mortgage interest, not on mortgages. Rent, the EIDL loans you can spend the money in those same things, uh, but there is uh, uh, there there are uh, ways in which you can. That the audio is real. Is there anything I can do about
I'm back. Uh, as if uh, you're for sure going to repeat the um, cross my finger audio is on the other end. Who are still recording properly. Uh, let, let's talk about P. So first things first, I can tell anybody that things are they were on unprecedented. Uh, 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 no one. So there's not a playbook. And so I think it's uh, reasonable, certainly, to be frustrated, frustrating to work with the government, with the SBA, with the banks, uh, so much uncertainty, uh, but also maybe give a little bit of grace because uh, there are, uh, I want to say it's 90 members have, have gone out to small businesses this week alone uh, as of last night. Uh, so the money is flowing uh, uh, just uncertainty. Okay. Uh, PA, uh, they when they published the law, they had guidance on how the law, right? Uh, and there have been two IFRs that uh, came out on. So, uh, and another one is on the 14th. What I would say is you're going to see me uh, point out there are several. Uh, uh, there, uh, and I'd say pretty significant open end that we still have but uh, the April 14th IFR did bring some clarity what I'm going to do my best is to explore is uh, I think you can for sure but also try to uh, that remain uncertain so uh, the first 350 billion that funded this ran out in 14 days the second uh, the three, uh, on track to do um, uh, that, um, yeah, and I'm getting blown up by a handful of people, so it's obviously not, uh, not just one person. I guess what we'll do, guys, um, in case the audio is, um, uh, and publish it another time. So my my sincerest apologies. Uh, this is a super important topic. Uh, we'll fast. Uh, I'll record in recorded version ASAP. So you can hear the issue. I'm going to press forward and walk, and continue through the presentation. Uh, if you simply can't hear me, know that we're going to get something in your hands as soon as possible. So the follow up and I'll continue. All right. So last week, uh, so in buckets to get a loan forgiven. The money, uh, 75% on. Five on payroll, interest on mortgage, forgiveness could be, not, it'll be a graduate. Hey, what I'm going to continue at a time. When does the eight week clock start? Well, the, to be crystal clear, there's a lot of, there are a lot of articles on here. You can hop on the SBA website, read this for yourself. There's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of information about this. The eight-week clock starts ticking the day you get funded. It is not the day you applied. It is not the day that you start using the money. It is not the day that your business reopens. And this is where the rubber hits the road for people. Is uh, virus are still living uh, areas, state localities. You're not even allowed to open. Uh, there's a thing you talk through, which is the eight weeks does start ticking once you get funded. Once the once the bank hands you a check or deposits those the, those funds your account, you have eight weeks to period. So. Uh, today, so today's April 30th, 30th. If you got funded today, uh, color coded what the weeks look like. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, April 30th, May 24th, excuse me, June 24th uh, would be uh, the end of eight weeks. So you would have uh, to have all of your PPP payroll money and other, other uses money spent by the 24th. And that would be the only monies that would be even eligible for uh, reimbursement. So a couple things. It doesn't matter if A's course likely the business, I don't think it starts on a Thursday. Is we have monthly seminar on a Sunday or a Monday. Those lines. Okay, but if you guys clear, general cons. The law is when does the money actually go accruing for you? If you know your finance, you're accruing those expenses on days that you may not be paying. And if you're, for example, you may be accruing uh, a payroll that lasts the week of June 22nd in, this, in the bottom row there. Uh, but maybe your pay date isn't till Friday the 26th. Well, there is no guidance at this outstanding question. I'm going to get to include crude cash the 22nd, 23rd, or whether it's on the 24th for that partial, partial uh, pay period. So it's a big open ended question. But mo most important uh, thing to note on this slide is the eight week clock. It starts ticking the day you get funded. And, and that is quite unambiguous. Okay, the next thing is it relates to the, the eight week uh, clock once, once that starts ticking. Um, if you are a business that didn't have to close your doors, maybe you're a technology company, maybe you're a, a business services company, uh, that you know, employees could go home and work from home, even if you're in shelters, uh, you, you were able to continue operations, <clears throat> then this is probably not a big issue for you. Um, and it might make perfect sense to go for the maximum loan. If, however, you are, uh, you know, a restaurant, a bar, a nail salon, a massage parlor, a tattoo shop, uh, uh, some, uh, some other type of business that simply cannot even legally open your doors, uh, it's hard to pay your people if there's no work for them to do, right? So um, I would strongly encourage you to think about what that loan amount is going to be that you take. So um, in, in, in this example, I got one company that I just want to give, call out the difference between if you took the max loan versus a smaller loan. So if you're a company that has a monthly payroll of $100,000, PPP says the loan multiplier to use would be 2.5 times, right? So that would be a $250,000 loan. But it doesn't say you have to take the max, right? You could say 1x, right? And so let's say you only want a $100,000 loan because you're a business that isn't even open yet. And maybe, maybe uh, you're in Wisconsin and you're not opening until May 26th. I think that's their date up there. Um, and so, hey, don't take a bunch of this money that you're not going to be able to pay back, uh, because if you don't pay back the entire, uh, use the entire loan, then the entire loan is not going to be forgivable. So um, if you took the max 2.5x times $100,000 a month payroll, $250,000 loan, and spent 75% of that on payroll, you see the yellow number on the left, that's $187,000. If you don't think that you can spend $187,000 on payroll in your compressed timeline to keep your business open and still follow all the other rules, you know from day one, you're not gonna get all of your loan forgiven, right? And so as a business owner, 
uh, know that you're you're gonna get your payroll portion, whatever dollars you've paid in payroll, so long as it follows the rules, you're gonna give that portion of your loan forgiven. But it's a pretty strong incentive as a business owner to get your entire loan forgiven so that your uh, rent and your utilities are also paid while your business is shut down and you presumably have no revenue to offset those expenses, right? So it might make sense to take the smaller loan, in this case, $100,000 loan, even though you're the same company with $100,000 a month payroll, because here you'd only have to uh, have pay back $75,000 in, in the example on the right. So uh, uh, this is water under the bridge. If you've already been funded, I won't believe the point anymore, but if you have not yet applied, do so as fast as you can. If you have applied, but you don't haven't been funded yet, think about this number really hard and go back to the bank and reduce your amount if you think it's appropriate. Okay, talk about the forgivable expenses. So there's two types of forgivable expenses. Uh, type number one, 75% of the loan must be spent on payroll. So it could be more than 75%, but uh, it can't be 74%, it can't be 74.9%. 75, At least 75% of the loan must be spent on payroll for the entire loan to be forgiven, right? So uh, how do we calculate that? So no, pay, no person in your payroll can make over $100,000 per year or 83, 33 per month, okay? Now, if you'd have individuals that make over 100,000, uh, that doesn't mean that they can't be part of the calculation. And, it, and it's the same calculation for getting the loan as, as it is repaying the loan. It's only the portion over $100,000 uh, that goes in the calculation. So what is included in that $100,000? So first, uh, employer, certainly wages. I uh, didn't list that, but I think that goes without saying. Wages are included. Uh, employer paid health insurance and, and benefits are included. Employer paid 401k matching contributions are included. An employer paid state and local taxes, uh, for example, unemployment, because unemployment insurance is uh, administered at the state level. Those are all included. Next bullet, what's excluded from the calculation? So uh, any dollar amount over $100,000, regardless if it's salary or commission or bonus, any income over the 100000 is excluded, only the first 100000 uh, and also excluded, and I see some questions come in on this topic, it's a heated topic, uh, the employer portion of payroll taxes, uh, federal taxes, specifically uh, Social Security and Medicare. Okay, so uh, when it comes to owner's uh, compensation and draws, so uh, whether you're a sole proprietor or an LLC, you can put yourself on payroll, so you're paying yourself and that could be part of the money that is forgiven. Uh, if you're an LLC, or uh, it's a heck of a lot easier if you uh, W-2 yourself um, uh, versus uh, being a, uh, on just a draw. W-2, it's easy. Right? Uh, you calculate your wages the same way you would your employees. Uh, if you're not a W-2 employee and you take a draw against your LLC, uh, then you really are going uh, to the uh, uh, 2019 Schedule C from your from your tax return, and specifically 931 where you're talk, looking at a net profit or loss. And so you're gonna have the same uh, 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 compensation test as any of your employees. So typically owners uh, uh, draw a larger income. Uh, it's the nature of owning a business for many people. Hopefully everyone, it's at least their ambition to do so. Um, uh, but you can't draw more than that $100,000 run rate. So uh, you can't do more than 8,300 a month. You can't do more than 3,800 in a bi-weekly period. What is unclear and there is no SBA guidance. Uh, we already talked about it as the cash versus the cruel, uh, but also bonuses. So uh, the way uh, SBA defines wages uh, includes really all types of compensation. It can be salary, it could be hourly, it can be commission, it can certainly be bonuses. What is unclear, and I think there's general consensus in the, in the accounting community, is that bonuses uh, uh, are fine so long as they are part of your normal compensation program. So if you normally pay bonuses, and if that's a regular thing, then uh, certainly you're on safe ground. I shouldn't say certainly because you're not clear guidance, but you're, you're, you should be on safe ground. If you're gonna use, and this question has come up a lot, if you're gonna try to use uh, bonuses uh, to, to pay people just to simply use up the PPP money, 
it is unclear whether uh, the SBA is going to do anything about that or not. It would certainly not seem to line up with the intent of the law. So it would certainly seem that there's going to become further clarification that that's not going to be allowed. Okay, um, that, that, that that's what that's what we would expect. Um, uh, I, I think this is maybe one of the hottest issues uh, that still need the contested issues that needs to be figured out because if you're uh, one of these millions of businesses who are in a shelter area, you can't open your doors, you've maybe already gotten funding, uh, gotten funded, uh, you're looking for ways to ethically spend this money to pay your employees, get them off of unemployment if at all possible, get them on your payroll so they're being funded by PPP dollars instead of unemployment dollars. Uh, but you don't want to do it in a way that leaves you on the hook uh, as the business owner with, with that uncertainty. So uh, therein lies maybe one of the single largest dilemmas uh, 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 of the whole PPP program that is that we're still waiting on answers. Okay. Um, the next, so it's two, two buckets of expense. Uh, payroll is the big one, at least 75%. The other, the other is other, and it really comes in three buckets. Uh, the SBA defines four buckets, payroll, rent, utilities, and interest. And so the other three, uh, rent applications, utilities, interest for rent, um, uh, it, what we do know is that this, any payments for a lease agreement that, it, that can be enforced, it's gotta be something that was in place before February 15th. So it can't be something that uh, uh, you just signed up for, uh, even if you assign, entered a new space and have a new lease starting somewhere, uh, March 1st, it's, it, it's too late. It's got to be an existing established uh, rent. Um, it, what is unclear, and I have it in the blue, uh, uh, it most likely, the, it seems the intent of the law is for leases of real property, such as office space. Um, but there's some ambiguity of whether rent could include uh, rental of things like equipment, right? So I would say, uh, consult with your lawyer, consult with your CPA, most importantly, consult with your bank because they're going to be the arbiter here of what does and doesn't get forgiven. Um, utilities, pretty straightforward, right? Electric, gas, water, transportation, telephone, and, and internet. Uh, as long as those services began before February 15th, those are uh, uh, considered uh, viable expenses to be forgiven. And interest. So, uh, the, the CARES Act uses the term uh, specifically covered mortgage ob obligation. Um, it doesn't doesn't explicitly say it's uh, mortgage on the building. Um, uh, so a couple of things. One, we certainly know that uh, um, the, you know, it's only to cover the interest payment of those mortgages, uh, whatever whatever form that 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 looks like. Uh, the money is not intended to fund. Uh, principal payments and directly uh, therefore kind of go in the net worth of, of the owner, uh, but at least the expense portion of that payment, which is the interest, right? Um, and and I, I'm, I'm quoting my last bullet here from, from Witham, uh, uh, the, the, the tax uh, advisory service um, that it's, it's really, it is unclear here on whether this is mortgage or uh, real or personal property uh, interest, right? So uh, uh, it would certainly include debt on real estate. Uh, I, 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 the way they seem to be interpreting that is any kind of indebtedness, any kind of a loan that is going to have a lien, right? A UCC filing against that personal property. And if that's the case, then the interpretation would be that uh, the interest on, say, purchase of a business or purchase of equipment. Uh, as long as there's a UCC filing uh, of some type, that those would be eligible expenses. So um, the most important thing here, and anything in blue that is an unknown, uh, because there are unknowns and you're gonna have to make business dis decisions in real time, this is gonna be between you and your bank. So um, I think when we had audio troubles, I skipped over a, a little bit in the, uh, uh, the PPP versus the EIDL chart. Um, but the, one of the core differences, EIDL is a loan between you and the SBA directly. PPP is a loan between you and your bank. And there are 5,300 participating SBA lending banks. Uh, and so the relationship is you to your bank and the bank to the SBA. 
So the SBA guarantees the loans for the bank. And so if you were to squander the money or you had to default for any other reason, good or bad, intentional or not, um, the the bank is covered. Uh, they're, they're insured, if you will, from the SBA that they're not going to be out that money. But that bank, your, your local bank, still has to service the loan. They have to go through all the paperwork, all the processing, and these are low interest loans. They don't make a lot of money on this. So how much they're going to require from you, how risky they're going to be willing to stick their neck out, um, is going to depend on the risk profile and the makeup in the processes of that bank specifically. Um, many banks um, might take a, a, a fairly liberal interpretation. They might, one bank may certainly allow interest expense on purchase of the business entity or even equipment in a bank across the street might not. It, it, because this isn't about what uh, Assure or Mike Fenoy tells you in this webinar, the interpretation and the rules are from SBA. At the end of the day, it's about your bank and their interpretation of the rules and what they think that they, how much risk they're willing to take in proving to the SBA uh, that, that, that they can certify that the money was used in the proper way, uh, that if this thing goes south, they're not left hanging the bag, hold, left holding the bag. That's really what, this, what all this ambiguity is about. So uh, the, the main buckets, payroll, you got to spend at least 75% of it on, on payroll, uh, rent, utilities, and interest, uh, fairly straightforward with the outlier of uh, could rent and interest be on things other than straight up real estate office space. Okay, so what if you don't sp spend all the money the way you're supposed to? And, and, I should, and it's supposed to, that, that, that sounds overly harsh, but what if you don't spend all of the money, at least 75% of it uh, on payroll because maybe you're in a situation you can't, right? Um, uh, and, 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 and for whatever reason, maybe you, maybe you have employees, I know uh, clients who are trying to bring employees back that don't want to come back. Some of them are making more money on unemployment than they would with their employer. Some of them simply don't feel safe yet. Um, uh, there are obviously very different opinions about who feels comfortable being out and who doesn't. So there are going to be scenarios where businesses don't get the entire loan uh, covered, but this is not uh, forgiven, excuse me, but this is not binary. This is not uh, either the whole thing gets forgiven or part of it. Uh, if you fall short of the requirements for 100% forgiveness, there will still be partial forgiveness. So there, there are two factors uh, that go into that. And the first one is uh, the number of FTEs that you bring back. And the second is uh, the actual amount of pay and the wages paid to those people that do come back. So first, let's walk through the formula here. And, and it's fairly straightforward. Um, it, uh, the numerator, the top number here, uh, it, it's the average number of employees that you bring back during the eight weeks. And the uh, the PPP language, the CARES language, uh, says average number of employees, um, but it's really the number of employees total that you bring back during that period, during the during the covered period. Um, so this is an area that I, that uh, I think you should not be terribly concerned if they didn't come back day one um, uh, of you being funded, but you do bring them back. <clears throat> and one of the things we'll talk about in the upcoming slide is there's actually provision that says as long as you bring every, even if you don't bring everybody back yet, but you do so by June 30th, ironically, even if June 30th is after your eight weeks runs out, then it's still, still forgiven. So the idea, the intent of the law is to bring as many, if not all of your employees back as possible. The denominator then <clears throat> is really the, 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 the baseline, right? So how many employees did you bring back? versus how many did you, you did you used to have, right? And, and it, it's straightforward. So the, the denominator is either the one of one of two time frames, depending on say, you, this will help to account for say seasonality, right? So it's either the number of employees February 15th, 2019, so last year through June, th June 30th of 2019, or January 20th of 2020 through February 29th of 2020. So maybe you're a growing business and you didn't have that many employees uh, uh, 
in 2019 or and maybe you have more now maybe you're the opposite maybe you're a seasonal business and you had uh, uh, more then but January is your slow time so you had fewer at that point uh, at the at the election of the borrower you choose one of those two windows and that becomes your baseline to choose your percent of forgiveness so let's look at an example of how that might play out so uh, if we have an example of a company that has a loan of maybe three hundred thousand dollars and for this, we're gonna assume that all of the money is spent uh, on properly qualified expenses. So remember the four buckets, payroll, uh, rent, utilities, and interest. So all the money is spent in qualifying ways. <clears throat> and, and this company had a number of FTEs last year of 45 employees, okay? And the number of employees that they brought back during this eight week covered period was 33. So straightforward math, 33 over 45 is 73%, okay? So 73% uh, of a $300,000 loan is 220,000. So 300,000 minus 220,000, uh, in this case, the, the, the company would be forgiven $220,000. So that's $220,000 in payroll that you, that is completely forgiven. You don't have to pay that back. Uh, and they would be, be repaying $80,000. If I retread back to the eight week scenario, if you have not yet been funded and you start thinking about your, your, your calculus on how much money you should take or if you haven't applied for how much you should apply for, think about this. If you put people on payroll and they are able to perform a service for you and add value to you and to your customers, then this is a tremendous benefit for a small business, right? Literally having payrolls forgiven. If you're a business that is that is sheltered and can't open your doors, uh, and you do this to simply pay your employees and get them off of unemployment, you still have the burden of uh, federal employment, federal payroll taxes, right? So you could be out of pocket paying federal taxes on payrolls for employees that are unable to perform work for you and perform a service without any revenue to offset, which in which case it could hurt. So th there are some pretty important strategic decisions to be made of how much money to take and when you bring these people back on. Certainly the intent of the law is to get people on the payroll and off of unemployment, but as a business owner, you might not be in a position that you can afford to simply go backwards either. So really important to think that through. Okay. That's the formula for reduction in FTE. The formula for reduction in wages. This is an eye chart, so forgive me, but, it, but this is a complex one. It, it's, it's at least more complex because it's on a per employee basis. So first, remember the, the, the only wages that are covered here are wages under $100,000. So high earners over 100,000, uh, the dollars over 100,000 are, are excluded from, from this calculation, right? So those are considered to be the covered employees. And when we can't look at this in aggregate. We can't just say, hey, my total payroll during the old past period was X, my total pay payroll in the new period is Y, and how do they compare against each other? Uh, uh, to be certified for forgiveness, uh, your, your banker is gonna insist on some form of reporting and verification on a per employee basis, okay? So any covered employee whose pay drops by more than 25%. Now, if it's a salary person, it probably doesn't, right? If they're an hourly person working the same hours, it probably doesn't. But where, so how might pay drop? Well, you might uh, have an employee who doesn't come back and you replace them with somebody who makes less. You might have somebody who comes back but works fewer hours. You might have a salesperson come back and the selling climate is extremely difficult and their commissions are significantly down. So there are several ways uh, that, that uh, and there's the obvious uh, businesses who are hurting could in fact have payroll pay cuts uh, to staff. So lots of ways that you, you could get there. Uh, but on a per person basis, we're gonna multiply uh, their starting wage by 75% and then compare that to the, the what was paid during the eight week period. So I'm gonna real fast walk through these uh, uh, Five examples. So covered employee number one. Last uh, Q1 of 2020, they had 14,500 wages multiplied by 75%. 
So their adjusted Q1 is 10,875. If you paid them over that 11,000 during the eight weeks, then they didn't have a pay cut. There's, there's no dollars not forgiven. That's all forgivable money. <clears throat> Covered employee number two. Uh, Q1 wages was 20,000. So 75% of that is 15,000 in column four. Uh, and during that time, you paid them $14,000. So that's less, right? That's more than a 25% cut from what they were. But if you commit to restore them by June 30th, that money will be forgiven. That's really, really important to understand. So as you bring people on, if you have a commitment to certify, and what now this is going to look a lot different bank to bank, what they're going to require from you because there's not a clear formula from the from SBA yet, <clears throat> is uh, as long as you have a commitment to restore, that money will be forgiven. If I jump down, uh, so employees number three and five, uh, we paid them more than they made in pri prior periods, so no issue there. Em employee number four, let's start column two, 24,000. That's what they made in Q1 of 2020. So 75% of that, uh, that is 18,000. If that person made 14,500 during the eight week covered period, that means that the next column, yes, they had greater than 25% pay cut. Do you plan to restore their pay? Maybe this is a salesperson uh, who simply couldn't uh, earn as many commissions uh, and you're not in a position to restore their income uh, through through any, any number of reasons. That difference, the $3,500 difference <clears throat> would not be forgiven, okay? So you're gonna have to go through this literally employee by employee and, and demonstrate to your banker of who uh, whose payroll will be forgiven and whose payroll will not. Okay, almost done here. What we don't yet know, um, the, I, I might butcher the guy's name, Tony Nitty. Uh, uh, he's uh, one of the big accounting firms. He's a senior contributor at Forbes. He wrote a pretty good article the other day called 10 Things We Need to Know About PPP Loan Forgiveness. Uh, and I'll just read it. Uh, and lastly, none of it may matter because banks are going to make the rules. They don't know what the hell, and they don't know what the hell they're doing. So that's not necessarily me meant to be a shot at banks. Uh, there are 5,300 SBA lenders out there, all making up their own interpretations of uh, the of the PPP uh, as defined by SBA. <clears throat> and this has all happened so fast. This much money is never gone into the market so fast. Um, and so because of that, the, the trade-off is there's still a lot of ambiguity in the rules. And, and I would just come back to the point that the rules are going to be made up by your bank. So uh, the SBA gives guidance. And if your bank feels comfortable that you are a safe risk, certainly they have to at least do their very best to comply with the laws but they might go above and beyond. For sure, there are gonna be some bankers who are more conservative. I have a customer, we have a customer that I know, uh, their bank uh, wouldn't give out a single loan over $100,000 because that would just the risk profile of their bank. We have some banks that, uh, customers that their banks required all kinds of documentation from them, um, uh, while other customers had banks that had very light requirements to get their PPP dollars. Presumably, uh, the same will be true when it comes time to certify the use of those funds uh, when it comes time for uh, forgiveness of, the, of those loans. So just understand that uh, the, your bank does business with the SBA for just much like an insurance company, but it is up to your bank to work with you and you will have to certify to their satisfaction all of these expenses. So if you want to uh, 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 expense the interest on a, a mortgage for the building that you operate in. Um, it is reasonable that uh, some banks are gonna require seeing and evaluating the entire uh, agreement, uh, that you your mortgage agreement, and see all of the underwriting and see the amortization schedule to know to the penny how much of that, of that check that you wrote uh, to the bank was interest versus principal. And there are probably going to be other banks who want to see an amortization schedule only and may not go through the same level of due diligence. So uh, regrettably, that's a whole bunch of ambiguity for some of the most important topics on this call. But 
that is why you got to stay plugged in and continue to, to do your research in in uh, you know hopefully we've answered a bunch of questions in today's webinar we're going to continue to publish more content to help you kind of navigate these waters but at the end of the day this is about you and your bank and the relationship you have and what are they going to require for you to certify that the money was spent in the way it was supposed to be spent uh, uh, and to calculate the, the amount of forgiveness of those loans. So with that, I will uh, wrap on one slide. I think with the audio problems, I'm still, I've been still getting texts that, that it's terrible. So I think we'll skip Q&A. We're going to do a, a, a more thorough Q&A uh, as we repeat the event. Uh, but we do have uh, assuresoftware.com forward slash COVID-19, lots of resources out there. So recording uh, of webinars, uh, we've been doing webinars every single week for the last several weeks, uh, HR guidance, uh, Department of Labor guidance on FFCRA and the CARES Act for how to stay compliant, uh, how to get uh, and apply for stimulus money, and obviously today about uh of maximizing your reimbursement. Next Thursday, we do have another webinar scheduled, how to reopen uh, your business, top 10 questions answered. So from an HR perspective, from OSHA perspective, even if you work in an office, uh, you know how is it you're gonna provide a safe work environment? How are you gonna engage employees before they return? What if you have employees who make more money on unemployment uh, and don't wanna come back? What if you have employees who wanna come back but they don't feel safe? Uh, we're gonna answer all those kinds of questions in next week's webinar. So. Uh, apologize for any technical delays and audio challenges. Uh, uh, I, I would encourage you to come to this site. We do have some very special offers designed just for small businesses, including free HR, HR services. So no long-term commitments, literally sign up for the free HR services for 90 days, get unlimited access to the online library and call center to ask any HR questions you might have, free pay cards to unbanked employees, uh, uh, and uh, discounted COBRA services. Uh, if you're in an unfortunate situation, you do have to terminate. And I would I would hit this one hard. The last few slides I went through, how to calculate all this stuff. I'm, like I say, on the surface, it's simple. Uh, the devil's in the details. It really is complex. Uh, and we have developed a very specific CARES PPP payroll report uh, as part of the service we provide to clients. It will A, help you get your loans faster, easier, simpler. But more importantly for now is how to maximize the reimbursement uh, to, to make sure that the, the loan is being forgiven as it should and that you can run those reports and, and all of that is calculated for you. You're not gonna have to do this with a paper pencil uh, or spreadsheets with some uncertainty of the interpretation of the rules. So with that, I think we'll skip Q&A uh, and I, I thank you all for attending and hopefully we'll talk to you again on another webinar real soon.